All right, welcome. We are here to uh, attempt to make some sense out of a historic event, and we have historic figures with us today to help us do that. Um, today we'll be talking about the Reykjavik Summit, which took place in October 1986. And as you are aware here at the table, it is one of the pivotal events of the Cold War. And what we want to try to do today, we have four major objectives in today's exercise. Number one, is to uh, make some sense out of the historical significance of Reykjavik. Where does it fit in the context of the Cold War? Is it in truly one of the pivotal events? Probably yes. Um, two, what was the role of the Strategic Defense Initiative? How did it fit within the context of this discussion at Reykjavik? And uh, what is its follow-on implications? Where is, where is the, the follow-on to SDI today? Number three, we want to look at the nature of high stakes negotiation. What are the criteria for success? What was at stake in this discussion between these two individuals? And number four, as far as our technical learning goal here, what we want to try to do is learn how to analyze the origin, purpose, value, limitation of primary sources, which can include musty old documents full of acronyms and individuals who actually lived uh, during the period. We have primary sources in abundance this morning. So this is our, our objective, so let's get started. What we'll do here, what I'd like to do just for a couple minutes is frame the argument of, of what we're going to be discussing, and then uh, turn the floor over to General Abramson to give us some uh, in-depth insight into the nature of the Strategic Defense Initiative. So what was taking place in October 1986? This is the second of a series of four major summits that took place during the 1980s. On the left, we have General Secretary Gorbachev, who had been in office just over 18 months at the time that this conference took place. Uh, he is a reformer in the Soviet Union. It's probably at this point impossible not to be a reformer in the Soviet Union because the Soviet Union is flatlining as an economy. It's struggling. So he's dealing with something called perestroika, which is a restructuring of the economy of the Soviet Union. Sitting across from him is Ronald Reagan. 20 years his senior at this point. Ronald Reagan was a screen actor, um, and this is what is uh, commonly used against him by his political opponents, is that somehow he was a political and international lightweight. But this screen actor was also, <laughs> ironically, the only leader of a labor union ever to become president of the United States. He was the head of the Screen Actors Guild. He had years and years of negotiation experience. He had years and years of policy formation because he wrote his own speeches. He followed every issue uh, into the White House. So no one could figure out how this actor knew what he was talking about. Well, he studied the issue very carefully over a long period of time. He also ran the seventh largest economy in the world as governor of the state of California. So he came to the office prepared with an objective. He had a different objective with the Cold War. Remember we had what? The Truman Containment Document Doctrine. We had Eisenhower's rollback, right? Then we had peaceful coexistence. Then we had, under Nixon, it starts with a D. Detente, good. All right, and then we had a period where we emphasized human rights under Jimmy Carter. Ronald Reagan had a different philosophy. His philosophy of the Cold War is, we win, they lose. And in order to accomplish that, he embarked upon a buildup of um, defense capability. All right, at the time, you'll notice here, it's kind of an interesting place on the chart. In 1986, you'll notice that the Soviet Union had dramatically increased its nuclear forces. This came after, this came after the two uh, SALT conferences, SALT-1, SALT-2. Notice what's happening with SALT-1 and SALT-2. The U.S. nuclear arsenal is declining and plateauing, but the Soviet arsenal is growing. So when 1986 comes along, there's an acute problem here at, at this dramatic escalation of, of nuclear weapons. And you'll notice here, foreshadowing what happens, that the number of nuclear weapons drops off dramatically after the INF conference, which follows this event. So just to give you an idea of where we're going with the impact of this event. Now, what was driving the Soviets? Here are the economies that these two nations compared. At the bottom, we have the Soviet Union, which is 
uh, less than one half the per capita GDP of the United States. And notice that over its years following uh, Vietnam period entry into Afghanistan, it is flatlining. Whereas the United States, after about 1982, is skyrocketing. Why? Well, we had monetary reform under Paul Volcker and fiscal stimulus under Ronald Reagan with the defense program and a realignment of the tax policy and a number of other things that dramatically increased our economic growth. So our economy is on a tear and we're going to eat their lunch because it's growing so quickly. This is what is weighing on Gorbachev's mind coming to this summit. And that's why this becomes important because the strategic defense initiative known to its detractors as Star Wars was a revolutionary departure in defense policy. Uh, Ronald Reagan said that what made him interested in this program was that the idea that all throughout history, any type of warfare had a specific defense to find around it, except for nuclear weapons. And then the strategy was to sit there and allow yourself to get pummeled and then pummel your opponent back. And in the process, tens of millions of people die. Why not create a, a system in space that could intercept that? And we'll have a much greater picture of what all these moving parts are from General Abramson. Now, this, this program, of course, got a lot of pushback from detractors. They said it was nothing more than corporate welfare for the defense industry, that FDI was pork for defense contractors. Well, when you think about it, it's one of the reasons that economic picture looked the way it did. See, economic pork has this interesting aspect of a multiplier effect. It truly is a Keynesian idea of a multiplier effect. When you build a microprocessor for an F-14, it can also go ultimately into an iPad. When you build ARPANET, it can ultimately become an internet. So this is something that, if this were the only complaint, it still wouldn't have been a bad idea. But that's not all it was. This was a moral commitment on the part of Ronald Reagan. It was also considered by its detractors to be a juvenile science fiction fantasy. Remember that this came out coincident with the movie Star Wars. So this is Ronald Reagan's kind of fantasy effort. And then ultimately, in, a, in somewhat contradictory fashion, it gets cited as the deal breaker at Reykjavik. In other words, SDI now is a threat to world peace. So where did it ride in reality? Where exactly does SDI fit? And what do we know about the collaboration of these two individuals? <laughs> On the left, we have a dynamic technically competent Air Force general who has just proven that he can manage a multinational F-16 program, a lot of moving parts in a lot of different places. He's proven that he can get uh, things into space reliably with the space shuttle program. He's a graduate of MIT, of uh, University of Oklahoma in aeronautical engineering, so he knows the technical capability, command and staff college, industrial college of the armed forces. So he knows this relationship between the military and industry. What Eisenhower warned about the military industrial complex, he knows it intimately and knows how it works and has proven technical competence to initiate and conduct and, and bring about a system like this. And Ronald Reagan, uh, at this point is a true believer in the system, that he sees this as really the path to peace. This is something that is morally correct in creating something that can defend the United States. So what we want to explore here is what is the outcome of the collaboration of these two individuals? What was SDI at the time and what did it become? So I, I have the honor of introducing uh, a, a co-worker of mine. We both worked in the Department of Defense for a while with slightly different levels of responsibility. <laughs> and we both worked at Hughes Aircraft simultaneously, which was an honor and privilege. And now we find ourselves here today. So welcome, General Abramson. It is terrific that, that he has come from this kind of a background, technical background, uh, creative kind of background, and now he's helping you create yourselves into a force for the future. Terrific. Um, I'll just say one thing before I start any of this, uh, going back to that picture. <clears throat> uh, just before the Washington summit, remember that's number three, um, I was working at SDI and, and uh, <clears throat> 
we saw uh, we would go over and present things to the president uh, about four times, sometimes five times a year in the White House. He would invite cabinet members and others, sometimes uh, all kinds of people that I'd never know that were there. Uh, so we often held what was called a science fair in our side for the president. I got a call from the president that's uh, not to me personally, but from one of his uh, people in the Security Council staff. And they said, the president wants to make a speech before Gorbachev gets here to Washington. And he wants to make it absolutely clear that SDI is not on the table. So where can we go? What's a good backdrop? Where is a great audience that won't, because uh, remember the controversy was going, uh, that won't get in the way of the speech? So I said, oh, Lockheed out in Denver. That's perfect. And they had a massive mock-up of what they were proposing as the first space-based laser kind of a system. And that became the backdrop. Well, Reagan got there the night before. In the morning, we had one of those science fairs, and that picture was at the science fair. Now, I always thought that one of my strengths, maybe my only strength, was I could explain technology quite well to people who don't understand it. And in that picture, he's smiling. The kind of a person, his eyes would twinkle. He listen intently and let you know that he's really interested in what you're saying and all of that. And I thought, boy, I've really got this thing. We're doing fine. Then I went down the hall ahead of him. And he was walking with the president of Lockheed behind. Uh, and I showed him one last simulator, a massive simulator, that was for pointing lasers built there in the Rockies on the size of a 26-mile rock down underneath because it, so, it had to be really steady so we could measure how far we could and how accurately we point. And then after that, he got ready for his speech. I went over uh, for my little role in the, in the thing. And the president of Lockheed came over and said, the president shared something with me on the way. Uh, he asked me, do you think that General Abramson thinks I'm a rocket scientist? <laughs> he wasn't, uh, but, he, but he was a policy guru and, and absolutely, as you just stated, that he's just, at, he really had studied and thought of things. Now, I want to step back, though, a little bit, and I know you've uh, been talking about this, so you tell me if I need to be quiet down. Mutual assured destruction, mad. That was a period of immense confusion. There were papers being written, there were people all over trying to understand how do you persuade somebody when you're in on the brink of a war not to go into and use their best weapon possible. Uh, and so massive retaliation was one set of words that people would use. And we used that because we had the lead in the beginning. Remember, we had the bomb uh, in, in Japan and used it in Japan. Whereas the Russians uh, got their first atomic bomb four years later. So we had this period, but the Russians had massive conventional armies. They were threatening uh, Europe. We had to have a way that we could persuade them not only to attack, not attack the United States, but our allies as well. So as they began to build a nuclear capability, we still had the advantage. We called it massive retaliation. But when we both could deliver long-range weapons in the massive numbers that we talked about, now then you begin to use this mad thing. It's two adversaries, not four, five, or six. Let me give you an example. 
when the French began to build their nuclear weapons. And I knew the general who led that, his name was Galois, Pierre Galois, terrific guy, but that's all. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and he was working because he did not think that the United States would sacrifice their people for France. And I'd like you to think about that, Mr. Gorbachev. Uh, no, no, Mr. Khrushchev, right? Were you Khrushchev? No, no he was Khrushchev. I was Khrushchev. Oh, you were Khrushchev. Yes. <laughs> you have to have your, your shoe ready to pound. Oh, okay. <laughs> you can do that. Uh, you're threatening France maybe even beginning to move in a, in a path that uh, goes all the way back to 1870 and the Franco-Prussian and, and Russian war. And, that, and that's been traveled, France lost, and then suddenly the tanks really begin to roll. Who was the president? Just, Kennedy. Here's Kennedy. Oh, you were Kennedy. Okay. You already averted one crisis. <laughs> <laughs> what was your thought process? Would you, would you fire knowing the Russian would fire first? No. Probably. Right. Yeah. <laughs> what about, here comes the tanks, you can't stop them, the French can't stop okay. them, the Germans can't stop them. They're about to take France as the thrust into Europe and then spread out. Are you going to put your 260 million people at risk? So MAD only worked if it was not used. It was only a threat, and maybe it's a pet threat, kind of like your pocket here, fairly empty. <laughs> and it only worked if there was absolute reliability on both sides, so that there wasn't any kind of a accidental launch, and we all came close, and I'll come back to that. And there was no first strike advantage. While we were talking this, they were building to something that they said was a winnable nuclear war. No one's ever going to win. We had a triad, first bombers that could get there. They built bombers and they put their bombs in. We then built ballistic missiles, they built ballistic missiles. Finally, we both built submarines, and this one was always considered to be the survivable force hidden under the sea in different locations so that they couldn't think that a nuclear war would be winnable. There would always be something, but it would be the end of the world. With those warheads, could the world even survive? I, I, you know. I think it was Einstein who said something about, uh, and when, this is a paraphrase. I don't know what the next war will be, but I know the one after that will be fought with sticks and stones. <laughs> All of this was part of the argument, but the real argument became the scientists, usually led by the Union of Concerned Scientists, but, but very respected thinkers and people who said, we don't have to have all this, we don't have to be able to destroy the world if we have one submarine load of ballistic missiles. That's enough. So why don't we save all that money and not spend? And we were spending several trillion dollars on our nuclear uh, forces. And the right, nobody can count their, their money. 
finally, after years of debate, uh, uh, some very respected security leaders, Sam Nunn, uh, Perry, former Secretary of Defense, and two others that will come oh, uh, in a minute here. By the way, you're, you're studying <coughs> documents, right? Remember, these are not the truth. These are opinions. But they come as close as you can with somebody writing them down. When you talk to somebody who has been there or been there for part of it, depends on how much he or she remembers. And the ravages of old age are something that you should consider as I'm talking to you. <laughs> okay, next one. Okay, along he came. I was sitting at home. I was running a space shuttle for NASA. I had gotten home early and my wife and I sat down to watch this on TV, a little glass of wine, and it started out as exactly how it was intended to. This was a summary of where we were and what Reagan's plans were for the whole Department of Defense. Not terribly impressive, nothing. And then got to this last page. I had been on a briefing tour when I had the F-16, and I had the program manager for the MX missile, who was there with me, and we'd go all the way up into the Pentagon with a briefing every quarter. You know, what have we screwed up on? What are we doing right? Is the program over budget? Is the performance right? All those kinds of things. You'd report that. And I would be in the room in the back listening when the MX program manager would say, well, the missile's doing fine, but where are we going to put it? And they talked about all kinds of strange things. And the dumbest one of all in history was to take all of these tunnels and build them and put them underground in the state of Nevada. Now, the people in Nevada didn't feel too good about that. <laughs> <laughs> but this, this was going to be a way in which the tunnels would be there, the missiles would be there, but when it was time for the Soviet satellite to go over and count our missiles under the START agreement, that they could open up the top and they'd have the missile right there, and then the Soviets could see it. They'd close it and they'd move it in the tunnel somewhere else so it wouldn't be a target. Who is that going to fool? <laughs> Any way possible. First of all, we might have more in there, although they could count them as you come. Uh, we might have dummies. They even made some practice dummies and brought them in and made them exactly the same weight or a different weight, figuring that the Russians could either with a long-range telescope on the ground figure out how deep the tires went into the ground in order to say, oh, that's a dummy and that's a real one. You know, all, it, absolute nonsense. In fact, I was selected to be the program manager because Reagan made the speech in 1983. The Pentagon was confused. They didn't know what to do. They hadn't thought about it. Nobody had thought about it. This was an intellectual bomb that had been thrown into the middle of nuclear theory in such a way that everybody was. So the Pentagon did what they always do. I went off running the shuttle still. The Pentagon had two groups, one science group, very, very good, and one policy group trying to figure out what that's going to be. And meanwhile, they started looking for a director, and they wanted a civilian. Everybody knew it was going to be uh, so argumentative that a military person shouldn't be standing up in front of it. They couldn't find anybody. They wanted some people that 
people of my age were, I mean, really terrific people, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't buy into it. So finally, they were over there, and the same program manager for the MX now was still working that problem, and was and with the Joint Chiefs of Staff, they were in with the president. I only heard about this later. Uh, and after their discussion of the MX and the latest failure, where they were going to put it, is move to S to SDI. Now this is nearly a year later. Remember. No, no person. So, this ex-program manager of mine, now a four-star general at that point, said, uh, "Mr. President, you have you're never going to find a civilian. You got to have a military guy. I have one who thinks he's a civilian, <laughs> <laughs> and you pinned his third star on, and he had because." Reagan had come out to the fourth flight and landing a space shuttle and pinned my star. So you at least know him. So everybody gave up and said, well, maybe he can do the job. <laughs> so I was a second or third or fifth or whatever, but they only had two to choose. So anyhow, he made this speech. Then they said, and we want you to come over here. I mean, oh, first I went to the, and interviewed with the president. I, and uh, he said, uh, he just talked to me kind of a little bit about what he wanted. And then I said, Mr. President, we, in NASA, we have a great fund of credibility because we're absolutely honest and open about when we have a failure. If there is a failure, we get out, we explain it, and all that. And I said that this is so controversial. Perhaps we can have this, not like a military program normally, but as open as possible. Lots of classified stuff underneath. But when we do a test, let's be out and open and honest. And he said, that's it. And you get out there and talk about it, too. So I spent like half of my time managing the program and half of it trying to defend it. But it, so we made it as open as possible. Yes. May I insert one thing here, if you don't mind? <laughs> that when I was in my late twenties then, and I was a news junkie, but he, when he says he went out and and did this, I I remember listening to him, and I also remember <laughs> thinking when the first thing about Star Wars, I went, oh yeah, right, well, that could never happen, you yeah. know, because it's my non-science brain. But I, well, I was so honored to meet him because in my early formative years, 20s and all that, they just think that he's so There I, were a small I, number of people that, that might be the occasion. There were lots that didn't think so, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> but, <laughs> you had a way of explaining it that it, it seemed like, well, maybe something like this would work. The thing is, what could defenses really do? And I was very straightforward every time I testified in the Congress. And the, and the Democrats had a majority in the Senate for uh, several years in this key time. And they thought that they could get at the president with his folly. And I was the one that had to be there to take the spirit. So I testified more than any other U.S. defense official. So I said, you'll never be, you know, there's no Iron Dome like the Israelis talk about and name their system now. Be perfect. But it can really mess up a planet. Here is a launch, goes across, about 30 minutes, boost phase, the MIRVs. Does anybody know what a MIRV is? multiple warhead system. Uh, the way that we built up all those warheads, and the Soviets still stayed under start, they built a bigger rocket and put multiple warheads. The biggest one 
in the world when was the, it was called the Satan, the SS-18. And that had 10 to 12 warheads and lots of um, cones and balloons and different things that would confuse the radar. You could take those things off and get up to something like, we, we theorized something on the order of 26 warheads on that. Most of ours, we had three or four warheads on the MX. But that's how your count stays of, mi of mi ballistic missiles, but your warheads go up and you can claim it. So, if the warheads are still on the single missile and you can knock down the missile here, that's what made us be concerned with trying to be a space base so you could get... Okay, I'll try to speed up now. This was the first one. Three months after I started, the Army came in and said, we missed three times with this, this piece of hardware, this big as a Volkswagen. These were kind of like a spokes that they were compressed in the rocket and then they'd spring out so they'd get a bigger area. And this was because we didn't want to use uh, nuclear interceptors, I mean a nuke to knock out a nuke, that doesn't make sense, uh, especially if it's going to be over your country. Uh, so. Uh, we're experimenting with something we call hit to kill, which meant that there's no warhead on an interceptor, just comes through and smash it. But it's coming in at 17,000 miles an hour. Actually, it vaporizes much of the warhead. So my first problem was, oh, do I take this chance? <laughs> the Army's failed three times with this thing. Uh, so I put a team in and we looked at it. I could have turned it down, but I kind of back here where nobody could see, I flipped a coin and we said, we're going to do this. <laughs> and fortunately, we did. <laughs> so three months after we, we really got moving on the program, we had a victory. And that just took critics and knocked them off in the corner. <laughs> We hit several times with this thing called SR hit, a completely different mechanism. I won't go into all of those things. Um, uh, in just a few years after that. Uh, and, and most of the program was miniaturizing and making components work. So we shrunk down all kinds of, co of components. We had tiny rockets that big that were accurate enough that they could put into this from a Volkswagen down to something about that big for a space interceptor. Next. Uh, one was a mobile one called THAAD. There are now uh, several of these in the Middle East. Israel has two of them uh, and they're in South Korea and Europeans have looked at it, they're deciding. This one is really neat because it can be a short range or a long range. If you only have a minute to intercept, you don't want to be carrying around all the fuel that you would need if you were going to go out here for a 15 minute flight. So this was a way to dissipate the energy uh, and, and really make it work at, in, in, in. Uh, You had to have radars. Those stats have a mobile system. This is today now that are out there. We modified these huge radars, which were not very accurate, but could see out about 3,000 miles. This one, somebody got inspired. This all happened after I left inspired by the oil rigs floating out in the Gulf, and they said, we can put a great big radar on one of these things. They built only one of them. Uh, they're testing it. I don't think they'll try to build a lot of them uh, because they're vulnerable to submarines. Next. Now, we have about 30 ships 
each of these ships has some of the smaller ones 24 and some of the larger ones 36 interceptors. And these, we always have two out off the Korean in this, uh, peninsula in the Sea of Japan. One American and one bought and operated by our Japanese friend. Uh, we have some in the Middle East and use those and we can move them where we want to. Uh, the, uh, firing, it goes, the firing goes down into the ship, turns around, comes out in the bottom, the missile goes out, and it doesn't damage the ship too badly. <laughs> Next. Uh, we have satellites. These are much too expensive, unfortunately. Very long range. And they can see any, they can't see the rockets at Bach. Not quite. But they can see nearly any other kind of a rocket. Uh, and, and we can get a warning. And we have in place a command and control system. And I'll stop with that now, just to say it's here. It operates. The part that's missing is the directed energy. That was stopped. We made a lot of progress. We had big uh, lasers. Uh, there's an airplane that we had developed. We were working on how to shoot a laser up through the atmosphere where the atmosphere takes the beam and spreads it out and dissipates the beam. Uh, we had a, something called a free electron laser, which went, was a mile long at the Livermore Laboratory mm. underground, mm. you remember? Mm. Uh, and that the free electron laser, it was really good because you can pick any frequency. But you have to make the laser different. Other lasers, like a CO2 laser, or the kind that you use in an operation, they're, they're determined by the molecular material and the characteristics when the, when the electrons change energy frequency. But the point is, it exists, it's working, it doesn't have directed energy. So when you look at some of the papers that say it, it's gone, what they haven't told you is the truth that does exist, but we've never gone beyond what we define as our first stage. Mm -hmm. We're not doing the, the directed energy. However, we've used lasers, and one of the best ones I've just... We believed in a, direct, a, a directed energy weapon called a neutral particle beam. And we worked with that and just, they didn't get it off and launch it, but until I left, and just then, several months later, and then they sent me a special letter. We launched, we fired, we hit. <laughs> <laughs> so the directed energy part is missing. Now, with that, and I hope that, that what you get a feeling for, this isn't wasted money, it's here. The world has changed. We don't have a reliable group of people in Iran. We don't have a reliable set of terrorists who will use two-person control to ensure that an accident never happens. <laughs> In fact, we have a completely different kind of adversary. And when they get a nuclear weapon, and they're working on uh, missiles to get them there, or they'll put them in a ship and ship them in a moving tar cargo container, we will lose one or more American cities.